Hello everyone and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is the 6th of August, the summer is flying by and I hope this finds you all really, really well and happy and safe. Uh, there may be a few technical difficulties this week because I've actually changed my phone over and this is the first time I'm doing this on the new phone. So forgive me if I don't manage to catch all of your comments immediately, but I will do my best with the technologies as they stand. Um, so we've had some great questions come in uh, for this week, which we're gonna be getting onto in a moment. But of course it is also this week, prize week, which means that uh, we're gonna look back at the questions that we've been answering over the last month or so and the winner gets a prize. So I've been looking through some of the questions and we've got through lots and lots in the last month, which has been absolutely great. Um, but there has been, I think, I think for me, a clear winner. Uh, and that is uh, Christopher Beatum, aged eight, uh, who got in touch to say uh, that, well, was asking about uh, what it felt like to be in the ancient silver mines when we were filming them for uh, the ancient Invisible Cities Athens programme. Um, and what did it feel like to get into those tight gaps of the silver mines? And that got us all thinking about what it was really like to be at the bottom of the of the bottom of the bottom of the social pyramid uh, at Athens and really be the lowest slave class you could be, which is those poor individuals, men, women and children who had to uh, work in the mines excavating the silver ore, which then, of course, made Athens so powerful and mighty with its fleet. So, uh, Chris, you are our winner for this month. Congratulations. Do get in touch so that we can send you a copy of a book and it will be my Life in Ancient Greece book. So hopefully you will be able to find more uh, fun facts about living in ancient Greece, hopefully not in a silver mine uh, in there. And it goes in touch with an address and you can get in touch via the email michaelscottacademic at gmail.com or through the Facebook site. So do get in touch and we'll get that out to you and let us know what kind of dedication you would like in the book as well. Uh, congratulations. Thank you to all of you, of course, as always, for your great, great questions. And thank you all for tuning in today. It's lovely to see you. Hello, greetings to Switzerland. Um, as Switzerland, Switzerland and Sweden, in fact, as well. Thank you very much indeed for tuning in. Uh, so, OK, uh, moving on to uh, this time around, we've had a host of questions, some of which came up live last Last time and I wasn't able to answer um, but equally new questions you've been sending in over the past couple of weeks. Hello everyone, hello Rebecca, hello Valeria, hello Latifa, hello everyone. Great, great, great that you can join. Um, the first one is from Toby Tuvia who's asking what are the best books dealing with classical heritage during nationalist governments. Interesting, it's kind of a specific topic. Well, in fact, there's been a brilliant recent uh, Brill companion volume, Toby, which I would really recommend. And it's entitled The Companion to the Classics, Fascist Italy, and Nazi Germany. So it's particularly thinking about how the subject topics of the ancient Greek and Roman worlds were utilised, studied, thought about, uh, and really brought into quite powerful political play during those two particular nationalist governments, Fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. And that's been edited uh, by Helen Roche and Kyriakos Dimitriou. So that's a really, really great place to start because it will be a collection of articles looking at a range of different things uh, and different topics and different aspects, which will then give in each one, in each case, further bibliography if you want to investigate it further. Hello, Kerry. Great that you can join us from Western Australia. Fab, fab, fab. Uh, so it's nine hours ahead with you there at the moment is that right so we're two o'clock here in the UK so sort of late a late evening for you guys uh, out in Western Australia from Miami as well thank you so much indeed for tuning in right now I need to work out Miami East Coast so that's what about five hours behind so you are just about starting off your day I hope you've got a cup of coffee in your hand um, we are going to try and flex the time a little bit uh, so that we can try and get the West Coast of America uh, as well. We've had a few requests in from people who aren't able to tune in live because they're coming from the west coast of America uh, eight hours behind. So we're trying to find a time that works for people who are eight hours behind, that are nine hours ahead and somewhere in the middle as well. So uh, kind of we will just about uh, sort of at 9pm in Western Australia, Kerry. So seven hours ahead uh, in Western Australia, right, got you. So Eastern Australia will probably be a bit further. Um, Okie dokie. So we might try and flex it for next time and we're going to do a Q&A next time on the 26th of August and we're going to try 5pm UK time. Uh, now that makes it quite late
date in uh, Australia, but hopefully doable uh, and hopefully also doable in uh, Western uh, USA as well. Whew. Try and get through our chronological time zones. Good afternoon, LJ. Thank you so much indeed for tuning in. So, Toby, there you go. Hopefully that's a, a useful kind of starting point for your research. Uh, Chris Rowe was also in touch on the live Q&A last time, uh, asking when will the different TV series we've been doing be available on commercial download services? Now, I'm not quite sure what you mean by this, Chris, but uh, I know that uh, through the Facebook page, we do keep and flag up when the different TV series are available on DVD. Um, and equally when you get can watch them through Amazon Prime. Um, uh, and then, of course, we also try to flag up when they're being reshown on the BBC um, and thus available on BBC iPlayer. Hello from Greece. Thank you so much, Anastasia, for tuning in. Um, and uh, so what we... What, that's about all we can actually do, Chris, in the sense that we don't have any control over when these things are released uh, on DVD. That's a question for the BBC and for BBC Worldwide um, and more generally for the different distribution networks. So uh, that's as much as we can do is to keep flagging to you as much as we can know when these things are coming out. But actually, we're some of the last people to know uh, when they're being re-shown, particularly on the BBC and thus on BBC iPlayer. It's normally one of you guys who very kindly flags to us that you've seen it upcoming in the Radio Times or some such. Um, so, Chris, hopefully Hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, Clive, uh, you got in, oh, you cheeky Clive, you got in three questions, live Q&A, popping them in fast. So I'm going to pick up one, uh, which is, did the Greeks reach Cornwall? Uh, and yes, they did. Or rather, a Greek is supposed to have reached Cornwall. Cornwall. So some of you may be familiar with one of my heroes uh, from the ancient world, not the chap who went east, Megasthenes, the great ambassador of the Seleucid Empire, who went to the court of King Chandragupta Maurya in India uh, in the late 4th century BCE. But in the same century, the 4th century BCE, there was a Greek who lived in the Greek colony of Marsalia, which is modern day Marseille. And if you go there to Marseille, to the port today, you can see a statue of this chap. He was called Pythaeus uh, and he he set off uh, just around the time that Alexander the Great was conquering eastwards, potentially and possibly because there are some rumours in the sources that after he'd finished with the east, Alexander the Great thought about going west and conquering west and Pythias was sort of an advanced party trip. But he sailed out the Straits of Hercules, out of the Mediterranean, up around the western uh, coast of Spain and then hit this weird and wonderful place called England um, and indeed the sailed around we think as we reconstruct his narrative uh, around most of the UK and seems to have stopped off in Cornwall. Now I mean it wasn't a staycation it was very much a kind of trip far abroad but he sort of picked up on the vibes of later millennia as we all kind of head off to Cornwall under the beaches although we don't know whether Pythias spent any time sunning himself on the beaches of Cornwall but we do know that he was talking about the tin mines uh, that were very famous in Cornwall in antiquity. He then carried on his journey he didn't get sucked in by Cornwall cream tea uh, he continued his journey north he seems to have gone around the whole of the UK um, and then bizarrely uh, it seems to have decided to go even further north and starts to describe when the seawater turns to ice. So we think he's getting up into the Arctic Circle. Amazing. Then came back down very sensibly and entered into the Baltic, uh, where he then had an explore around the Baltic and has seen amber being washed up on the beaches of the Baltic Islands uh, before kind of making his way home again. So there's Pythias. He definitely did get to Cornwall um, and to the tin mines, but whether or not, as I said, he had a cream tea is unknown. Uh, so Clive, thank you so much indeed for that question. And thank you again for all your questions that are coming in. Sand and sandals holiday, says Clive. Brilliant, classic, absolutely fabulous. Um, oh, and you did have a second question, Clive, which I am gonna answer too. There you go, you can have a second one. The remaining section of the Delphic bronze is in Istanbul. Is that real? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Yes, it is. By this, I think you mean the remaining parts of the bronze and golden serpent column that was uh, erected at Delphi in the 5th century BCE as a monument to commemorate Greek victories in the Persian Wars against the Persians after the battles of Thermopylae, Salamis and Plataea. Uh, and uh, kind of after that, the Greek community of, of, of city-states who had fought against Persia uh, collected 
collected together and set up a nine meter high column, which was made of bronze, of three bodies of intertwined serpents reaching up until the three sort of serpent heads poke out at the top. Those serpent heads were in gold. And then on top of that, with a one leg, each, le each serpent head providing a support for a leg was a golden tripod, which was said to have been made with gold specifically taken from the enemy um, you know, on the battlefield. Uh, now, this column was very, very famous in antiquity for all sorts of reasons, and it stood at Delphi from the 5th century BCE through until the 4th century AD, when the Roman Emperor Constantine, who was setting up his new Roman capital of Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, decided that he wanted a few of the best of the best things from around the old Roman Empire to have in his new capital, to make that capital symbolic of being a little microcosm of the entire Roman world, and from Greece, the thing he chose to take was the serpent column at Delphi that had stood there by that stage for 900 years. So in the 4th century AD, after already so much history, the column got moved to be put in the racing track of Constantine in Constantinople, where it stood alongside giant obelisks from Egypt, as well as other things taken from Italy. And we know, because we see it in drawings of the Hippodrome, of the racing track at Constantinople, that it remained there on display for quite some time, and even survived into the Ottoman occupation of Istanbul after 1450. And it was turned into a fountain, amongst other things. Now, what is there today if you go into the uncovered and excavated uh, racing track of Constantine in modern day Istanbul in Sultanahmet? What you will find is the bronze intertwined serpent column reaching up still many meters up into the air, but with no serpent head still attached. But if you go into the Topkapi Palace, you will find in the Palace Museum there one of the surviving heads, serpent heads in gold, of the serpent column that uh, kind of stood at Delphi from the 5th century BC onwards. So yes, it's real and it is one of, for my money, one of the most extraordinary pieces of surviving material culture because we can trace its story right from the outset and think about the number of things that it has seen across the millennia that it has been on display to the different com cultures and communities that it's been on display to, the different things that have been, it's been used for and now Thankfully, amazingly, it still sits there today in location. Brilliant. Hello from Romania, Villa. Thank you so much indeed for tuning in. Brilliant. So Clive, thank you for that. Brilliant question. Tim, Tim McLean's been asking, I have a philosophy degree, uh, but want to get into teaching classics. How do I start? Okay, well, Tim, brilliant. First off, philosophy. You've probably done some classical philosophy already, so you are probably a shoe in for some of the modules of the classical civilization, GCSE and A-level already with a philosophical bent. Brilliant. You're halfway there. Um, depends a little bit on kind of where you want to teach as well. Uh, PGCEs are a necessary qualification if you want to teach within the state school system. They are a desired but not necessarily necessary uh, um, qualification if you want to teach in the private school system. So very much kind of your choice there. Would you, as you suggest, do a PGC in history or indeed you can do a PGC in classics? Now that tends to be more language focused with the teaching of the languages. A bit depends on your language background. If you do a PGC in history um, and then go on and sort of qualify as a history teacher, then absolutely one of the first things you should, you should do in your job is advocate for the introduction of ancient history, GCSE uh, and A-level into your school curriculum and you'd be a shoe in uh, for teaching that and possibly then after that you can get some class civ in there and then after that you can build up of course to converting the entirety of the school to classics brilliant so that's that would be my advice tim good luck let us know how it goes kerry and the copy in delphi yes of course so in delphi just a couple of years ago they put up back on the original location where the serpent column would have stood or did stand from the 5th century bc through to the 4th century ad they put up a replica of that column um, as it survives kind of today there is if you go around the through the modern town of Delphi, if you go along the main street and then you take the right, which curves up the hill, you kind of, it curves round to the side to a small plateau, a small marketplace where actually on a, I think it's a Friday morning, the modern city of Delphi has its local street market. And in that little square, there is actually a series of mini replicas of a number of different monuments that were once uh, on display in the sanctuary of Delphi, which includes a mini serpent column, which sort of is... It's cute, but it's a tad underwhelming, um, I have to say. Hello, Sarah. Thank you so much indeed for joining. Kind of, that's great to see you. Thank you so much indeed for joining in. Um, so, Adele Cormac, which of the invisible cities that you visited was your favourite? Ooh, now that is a tough 
question. Uh, Cairo, I think, was extraordinary. Um, to visit for the antiquities, it's not my favourite city as a place to spend time in. Uh, I think, kind of, obviously, Rome, from a point of view of Pat, there's great pasta on every street corner, and gelato as well. Sorry, I'm supposed to be talking about the antiquities here, aren't I? Um, I think one of the most surprising for me was Naples, uh, because there was so much more than I had really got my head around, um, and I was particularly excited to do the underwater uh, kind of archaeological investigation at Bai, and I, I've just noticed, and I think you guys will have seen it, and we flanked it on the Facebook page as well, that Greece has now opened its first underwater archaeological site where you can go and dive if you have a paddy uh, diving qualification to see uh, an ancient shipwreck in location and all the big pithoi storage jars still in location underwater. So they have a, it's an, it's an official underwater archaeological site, the first of its kind in Greece, and I will be off uh, there as soon as I can absolutely get there. Um, so Adele, thank you very much indeed for that. Now, we've had a question here from Chantal Brion. Did the measurement, this is really uh, innovative, I hadn't kind of thought of this, did the measurement of hectares uh, come from the Greek prince of Troy, Hector? Right, if so, how? Uh, kind of the, well, this is interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, Chantal Brion, did hectares, the measurement, uh, come from Hector of Troy? No. Sadly, uh, Hector, although it kind of, you know, we admire him for so many things, uh, kind of is we don't admire him for laying out um, the grid area of what is 100, 100 square metres, um, 10 by 10, 10 by 10 metres. Um, in fact, but, but there is a classical connection, you will be pleased to know, Chantal. So, uh, Hector can be broken down into two words, Hect, uh, from the Greek, for 100, um, but then air uh, uh, re kind of or hect air as we would pronounce it does in fact come from the latin aria uh, so it kind of means just sort of an area of land um, and an air uh, kind of uh, is is the sort of base unit if you like so sorry i got that wrong way around haven't i an air is the thing that is 100 square meters uh, a hect Hectare is 100, 100 square metres, so it's actually 10,000 square metres. Um, and uh, then you have, so we often talk about a hectare, uh, but actually there are smaller, I found this out when I was looking around at this today, there are smaller units, so which we very rarely use, but there's the decaire, which is, hang on, let me get this right, 10 metres squared. So an air is 100 square metres, a hectare is 10,000 square metres, and a decaire is 10 square meters, and there's even a centiaire, which is one square meter. Well, hey, there we go. Uh, like kind of thing, you can, you can use airs to your content now. Um, so, you know, when you're out there, if you really want to impress uh, people about your kind of land measuring knowledge, you can mention uh, the hectare, uh, the decaire, and the centiaire, um, and then you can talk about their classical connections. So sadly, nothing to do with Hector uh, of Troy, but indeed there still there is, as always, as there should be, a classical connection. So Chantal, thank you so much indeed for that. La Latifa is asking me to keep talking about the gelato. Don't get me started on gelato, Latifa. It's a very, very, very passionate subject for me. Um, and kind of all I have to say is uh, that you want gelitis in Rome. Gelitis, best uh, gelato shop around. Uh, it's worth the queue. Go back at least five days in a row to give yourself a chance to work through all the different flavors. Um, and that's my kind of tip for Rome. If you're in Athens, I would eschew the ice cream and I would go for yogurt. If you get off at the Acropoli Metro stop, uh, and you walk up towards the new Acropolis Museum, but instead of turning left to the museum, you turn right as if you're going through to the Temple of Olympian Zeus and the Arch of Hadrian, uh, and you come across on your right a yogurt shop which specializes in offering you the choice of at least 10 different kinds of yogurt made and small batches from different types of milk in different parts of Greece with different yogurt manufacturing processes, all with their distinct flavours. And then, if that wasn't good enough, you can then choose from at least 20 different types of Greek honey as well, made from different parts of Greece. And then throw in some nuts, kind of of all different varieties, on top of that. That is what I uh, kind of would recommend. And you're quite right, Clive, I've been advertising. I've been advertising, haven't I? I should at least get some sponsorship. Free gelitis for a year. Is there vegan gelato? Ooh, good question, Sarah. That I don't know. You might be able to find it out on the gelitis website. But uh, kind of that would be the way to go for if you're in Athens or if you're in 
Um, right, we're going to take a quick break to have a look at some of the things that have been happening around the world. Um, sorry for making you hungry, Eleni. Uh, kind of, it's got me quite hungry, actually, for gelato now as well. Um, so we've had some amazing things uh, coming up. Ancient Greek sanctuaries. There's been some new investigations, particularly into the healing sanctuaries of uh, Asclepius. Now, you will remember that we um, flagged on the Facebook page there's been some big big finds at Epidavros in the last season and a half that have been further investigated this season, looking at the very earliest layers of the sanctuary of Epidavros, and that's really exciting that more's coming out there. But equally, um, we're now looking at the ramps that these temples seem to have had and whether they were kind of actually an early form of disability access uh, for people who had trouble uh, kind of moving around um, and thus kind of needed some kind of extra help to, instead of trying to get up the big steps to get into the ancient temples. That's really, really interesting, thinking about how the ancient world conceived of made space for uh, people with disabilities, who well, there would have been a lot more of them than we imagine from simply looking at the sculptures, which are all these kind of sort of, um, you know, super uh, magazine, photo glossed, uh, muscle bound kind of people, actually because of the nature, the hard nature of life in antiquity, many, many more people would have had some kind of uh, disability uh, pr often gained through their lives. Um, so whether that was from some kind of arteriosclerosis or malaria that they then re only semi-recovered from, whether it was some kind of war injury, whether it was some kind of foot injury from the moving around kind of constantly on foot, or whether it was some kind of disability with which they were born, kind of actually we have to imagine the ancient world a lot more full of disability than we currently do. Uh, Roman amphoras have been discovered in a frozen seafood shop in Spain. The police raided a frozen seafood shop. So if you are a frozen seafood shop owner out there and you have a stock of ancient Greek jars hidden in your deep freeze, beware. Uh, yes, they found uh, 13 Roman amphoras and an 18th century metal anchor that were all being hidden in this frozen seafood shop. Naughty, naughty, naughty seafood shop uh, in Spain. Uh, the curators are, have, I love this, museum curators have been so inventive during lockdown and you've probably been following this as I have, the battle for the best museum bum, uh, not of curators, uh, but of the sculptures uh, from antiquity that they house in their museum. So keep an eye on the best curator bum. Tell us uh, what you think about the victors. Um, kind of Yorkshire, this is being led by Yorkshire. Brilliant. Yorkshire Museum is calling on collections around the world to display their best behinds as visitor numbers fall during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yorkshire has decided that the way to fight back against COVID is with the best bum around. Well, there we go. Uh, and uh, Claire, who, as you very well know, helps me uh, kind of keep this all show on the road, has suggested a classical museum bums battle of our own. Now, let's be very clear. I'm not expecting or asking any of you to start sending photos of your own bottoms into the Facebook page. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that if you do have photos of classical bums from your tours of ancient sites uh, and only of sculpture, please. I'm not suggesting anyone any, any photos where you've sort of got naked on an archaeological site should be sent in either. Uh, uh, photos of classical sculpture of bums, uh, please do send them in to the Facebook page and we will be having our own little mini classical bum competition uh, and we can blame Claire for this. Claire, this is entirely and utterly your responsibility. Uh, I deny all knowledge of everything. Um, uh, then, okay, we've had some absolutely brilliant stuff come in as well that I wanted to flag with you. But well, we were talking about uh, the uh, new underwater archaeological museum that the Greeks have set up. They're calling it the Parthenon of Shipwrecks. This is off the coast of Alonissos in the Western Aegean. And you'll be able to dive if you have your paddy license from the 3rd of August to the 2nd of October. While those who can't yet dive because they don't have their license can do a virtual reality tour as well in the main town. So get to that. Um, very interesting, closer to home as well. And this is a project that my brother has been working on and flagged to me that they found Roman and Bronze Age finds at Water Beach Barracks. Um, so Oxford Archaeology East has been working with developer Urban and Civic and Cambridgeshire County Council's historic environment team, where they found three areas of Roman settlement, two areas of Roman industry and numerous areas of medieval field system. Who knew that everywhere you look, you find a little bit of the ancient world. And that includes in the Roman Gallo Roman city of Ukatia, where they've discovered new magnificent mosaics.
Isn't it wonderful? The fines just keep on coming um, every every way. Um, what's new? One thing I wanted to flag to you, which hopefully you've caught from Twitter or Instagram or indeed the Facebook page, is that we have a new You're Dead to Me podcast out that I did with Shafi Korsandi and Greg Jenner. Uh, this was the first of the new kind of COVID-19 secure You're Dead to Me's that we uh, video, we did, well, we videoed via Zoom and we recorded uh, via Audacity um, from our each three independent homes without having to be in the same studio together and it was a really great privilege to come back um, to help your dead to me move to this new phase it's phase three if you like so uh, I was very lucky enough to do the first ever taster tape for your dead to me which was obviously about the Spartans um, we then came back in season beginning of season two to do the Olympics and then they came back to the surefire win team of myself Shappy and Greg Jenner and of course the ancient world uh, to uh, road test how best to do this in a Covid atmosphere with sound and you can now listen to that uh, on BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcast. So please do let us know uh, what you think about that. And we have a couple of minutes that we can get a few more questions in. Uh, right, uh, so where did we get to? Um, so Chantal, you actually asked a second question, and I'll let you have a second question this time after Hector was so much fun the first time around. Thankfully, it was not about land measurements. Um, this was uh, asking about groundbreaking speeches from antiquity that have changed the course of thinking or history. Have any of them uh, survived, and can we sort of you know indulge ourselves in them? Yes, we can. Um, this is the brilliant thing. So things like... Um, the speeches of Demosthenes, kind of from the ancient Greek world, if you think about the speeches of Demosthenes, kind of where he stood up in the assembly uh, and was renowned, of course, for his rhetorical skill, and particularly vis-a-vis -vis how Athens negotiated with Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, the great key speeches where Athens decided to be friend or foe um, of Philip, and Demosthenes was very much on the side of Athens being his foe, kind of, we have them recorded surviving in Demosthenes' own collection of speeches. Think of the Roman world as well, Cicero. He's writing down and was recorded and how well, it rather was transcribed by his slave, wasn't it? Famously, uh, kind of his uh, speeches that he gave in different parts of Rome and in different institutions and organs in Rome, some of which were absolutely crucial for turning the tide of history. Think about the great writer Thucydides as well, who loved recording the speeches and really made it about human actors being able to turn history uh, from critical moments of their own talking. So think about Pericles' funeral oration that's recorded in Thucydides. Think about some of the assembly debates uh, that are in Thucydides. Think about particularly the Mytilene debate where he records the Athenians speaking in the assembly about how to punish Mytilene for revolting against the Athenian empire and then how the Athenian assembly the next day change their minds and go, oh God, we've done the wrong thing. Uh, we need to move forward. So tons and tons and tons of great epoch-making, history-turning moments those speeches are recorded for us um, from the Greek and Roman world and it'd be brilliant um, to bring those alive and maybe we could do some um, recordings of these. I know that the actors of Dionysus are hoping to move away from just giving their daily dose from ancient drama to actually thinking more widely about ancient literature and getting a kind of ancient history week together um, so that we can do some of these great historical speeches as well and bring them into play. So we look forward to seeing more of that and I'm hoping to do a couple for them as well. Sarah Scotty, you've been reading The Wonders by John Wolfe and you've been uh, reading about dwarfs in the classical world and the polarised views they created. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, actually, if you go to the British Museum uh, and you sort of walk into the Hellenistic world area, uh, one of the things you, you I, I'm always struck by is you suddenly start seeing collections of, from miniature little figurines all the way up to bigger, uh, bigger kind of mini statues, uh, statues of dwarves, of uh, people with hunched backs and other disabilities. Um, and this is really is a phenomena in art, at least, of the Hellenistic world and after, as Hellenistic artists seem to be ever more interested in demonstrating and putting into stone the wide variety of people that actually did make up the ancient world in its reality um, and actually having them as part of the sculptural record. And there's all sorts of arguments about why these statues were then quite popular, what form did they what function did they provide, particularly in the smaller kind of form, amulet form? Um, why some of these are particularly 
what we're often known in artistic terms as grotesque, even though we probably want to step back from that label uh, nowadays. Um, so yeah, there's lots, lots, lots going on and much, much more to be done in this area to understand why these things were so popular. Now, oh, we've got time for just one or two more questions. Um, and Catherine Ancy's 10 year old nephew has been in touch and is asking whether Roman kids go to school. Now, I don't know whether your 10 year old nephew, Catherine, is planning to use my answer as some kind of argument for why he does not need to go to school or, or to seek uh, some kind of revolution of his class from his school teachers. Uh, I don't think he should because Roman kids did go to school. Well, kind of. So during the Republic, the Roman Republic, there were sort of three things that it could happen, really. If you were from a very poor family, you would not be going to any kind of formal schooling. You would be taught what your parents could teach you at home. Uh, so you would be very much homeschooled, if that's even a word that we can use to describe the sort of education you would get. If you were from a kind of middle to middle upper kind of uh, financial class background in Rome, then you might well go to some kind of group tutor. You might go to the house of an actual tutor, an official kind of teacher figure, who would then work with you and a group of other students and tutor you. And if you were from the creme de la creme, you would be back in the home again, but this time with your own private tutor dedicated purely, purely to you. What would you be learning? Uh, you'd be learning to read and write and you'd be learning math. So you'd be learning the key skills that we still teach in schools today. But after that, the emphasis was very different, uh, particularly for the middle and upper classes. Uh, with your group tutoring or private tutoring, you'd be exposed to Greek language and literature, which was supposed to be the symbol of a very well finessed education. Um, and you would also crucially, crucially be introduced to uh, rhetoric and the skills of oratory. So this is what you would have to master. This is what the ultimate goal of the Roman education was, to instill in you, on the one hand, key Roman values, make you a citizen who could do reading, writing, and arithmetic as was necessary to be able to function within Roman society. But if you really wanted to succeed in Roman society, then it was all about honing your oratorical and rhetorical skills um, to be able to speak. And that brings us back to the idea of speeches, because actually it was your idea to, ability to be able to speak convince others and sway the great mass of Rome to your opinion that really made the difference as to whether you would succeed or fail. Uh, thank you so much indeed for your question. Right, that's all we're time for. We've run out of time. Um, I'm going to come back to Catherine Nancy's 10-year-old second question, which was about pets in the ancient world next time. And next time, as I mentioned before, was, is going to be the 26th of August, and we're going to do 5 p.m. UK time. So push it a little bit later in the UK to hopefully bring in the West of America. Hopefully that doesn't make it too late for you in Australia and everywhere else in between. In the meantime, have a lovely rest the next couple of weeks of August. The temperatures are going to rise in the UK at least this weekend. So enjoy, stay safe, stay well, look after yourselves and one another, and we'll see you soon. Take care.